Hello everybody, a very warm good evening to you all. TMYS welcomes you all to the stories of flood and displacement under TMYS review September 2021. As you know that this September 2021 issue of TMYS review has already gone up last month and is now available worldwide via Amazon. This issue focused on displacement and rehabilitation of flood victims in collaboration with Environmental Humanities Center Amsterdam. So uh, this is a celebratory panel and it's an absolute privilege to have Dr. Robert Ivermi uh, with us today. And obviously two of our esteemed contributors, Ankita Datta and Samulima Saikia. So let me introduce with them first. Uh, Dr. Robert Ivermi is a global and imperial historian focused on British and European colonialism in South Asia. He is lecturer in British con uh, civilization at Catholic University of Paris and project manager at Swiss University London. His latest book, Hoogly, the Global History of a River, considers the integration of the river Hoogly into global networks of encounter and exchange during the European colonial age and colonial and post-colonial attempts to control the river. We welcome you, Robert. Thank you for joining us today. Thank uh, you. Thanks for that kind introduction, Lunita. Uh, next, we have our two contributors, uh, Ankita Datta. Ankita Tata has completed her master's degree in English and is currently pursuing BA. Besides being a school teacher, she is also doing an international PG diploma course to become an English language trainer. She is adept in Sanskrit. George Orwell's 1984 is her scholarly inspiration. Ankita's research interests lie in the English postcolonial dystopian literature and she looks forward to pursuing for uh, this for her doctoral studies. Besides academics, uh, she is interested in culinary art and is also a trained Bharatanatyam dancer. We welcome you, Ankita, and congratulations you. that you congratulations that you get published on a September 2021 issue of TMOS Review. Yeah, thank you again. Thank you so much. That was lovely. Yeah. Uh, our next third uh, esteemed guest for today is Professor Samulima Shaikia. She is working as an assistant professor in the Department of English, Gargao College, Sivsagar, Assam, India. She has presented research papers in various national and international seminars. Besides editing a number of books, she has also published a book of poems titled Palimpsest. Uh, her poems have been published in Borderless Journal, Muse India, Indian Periodical, Virtuoso, Tista Review, Soul Connection, newspapers like the Assam Tribune, the Sentinel, and anthologies like Antargata, Fragrance of Life, and the Kali Project Aids. She is also the recipient of Best Poetry Award 2020 in the Writers' Festival organized by Cape Comorian Trust. Moreover, she also contributes short stories and prose pieces in regional dailies, magazines, and online platforms. She is the editorial member of Ruminations, a peer-reviewed biannual international journal. Further, she is member of Association for English Literary Studies, ELTAI, Education Research and Development Association, among others. We welcome you, Professor Saikya, and congratulations to you too that you get published in September 2021 issue of TMOS Review. Thank you, Mohamita, for the introduction. And uh, thank you also for inviting me to this panel discussion. I'm really humbled and honored. And last but not the least, I am Mohamita Pal, a scholar of English literature. I have completed my post-graduation from Bankura University and also qualified QC Senate with GRF in uh, June 2020. I have been with TMYS Review as a project assistant for the Flood Drive and Displacement Project, TMYS Review 2021. So without further ado, let's begin this exciting session with Dr. Robert Ivermi first. 
Oh, Robert, you have written such a fascinating book on Hooghly uh, that tells us the story of a whole period through the course of the river Hooghly. So my first question to you is, how did the idea of the book come about? And how did your journey of discovering Hooghly start? Thanks, Namita. Um, the idea for the book came 10 years ago. I can't believe it was quite that long but it would have been in uh, November and December of uh, 2011 when I was a PhD student and I was doing research uh, in the West Bengal State Archives in, uh, in Kolkata. During the week, I would be in the archives, but at the weekend when I wanted to get out of the city, I would, um, I would travel up and down the river um, using the, the train lines that go up and down each side uh, and crossing the river on the small boats for small ferries that kind of link one side with the other. And um, the idea for the book started there, I was struck by, by how in a really small stretch of river really, um, north of Kolkata, um, it was possible to find the remains of um, what the other European settlements uh, on the river dating to the colonial period. So working upwards from Kolkata, but of course, the Danish at Serampur, the French at Chandanagar, the uh, Dutch at Chinsura, and of course, the, the original European settlements on the river, the Portuguese uh, town of Hooghly, now uh, Bandel. Um, so the idea for the book came, came there, really. Um, I wanted to write a book about European colonialism in Bengal, my original research, my PhD was specifically on the English. Uh, and I wanted to broaden out really to, 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 to write about the Hooghly as uh, a place where those different Europeans came together in cooperation and in conflict and their relationships with the people who um, lived along the banks or near the Hooghly um, through the centuries. Um, that's that's what I set out to do, and hopefully the book does that. Okay, uh, that's really great. So uh, my next question to you is: In your book, you have given us uh, fascinating insights on River Hooghly, especially its historical context, and as a witness of various important incidents, not just of global exchange, but also the way different foreign settlements like Mughals, Portuguese, uh, French, Dutch, Danish, and English interacted with each other and with the local population. So uh, if you can give us a little insight on that. Yeah, of course. Yeah, over time, I begin to, began to realize that one of the things that was really interesting about the arrival of the different European trading companies on the Hooghly River starting um, in the late 16th century and going right through to the period of kind of English dominance from the mid 18th century onwards, I began to realize that the way in which the river was connected with um, the rest of India, the rest of Bengal and the rest of India going inland and across the Bengal Delta, I guess, and also the way in which the river was connected with the Bay of Bengal and the Indian Ocean and well, the rest of the world, I guess, that became the kind of frame through which I was viewing the river. And that's the kind of global history approach that's in the book's subtitle. One of the things I wanted to do was study the way in which the Hooghly was increasingly closely connected with um, places further afield, um, connected commercially, but also for the movement of people, uh, and also, and that hopefully comes across in the book, for the movement of ideas as well, to how certain ideas move between the Hooghly uh, and Europe, for example. You mentioned um, you mentioned the Mughals. I realised fairly early on that the arrival of the Mughals in Bengal, uh, the development of Bengal as a Mughal province, and then the separation of that province from the Mughal Empire was also a really important part of the story because that's, of course, the backdrop, really, um, the event that is going on or the series of events that are going on in the background as the different Europeans arrive on the river. So there's a chapter in the book dedicated to um, Bengal under the Mughals and uh, as the separation of Bengal from the Mughal Empire is engineered, 
uh, at the beginning of the 18th century by the, 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 the two dynasties, in fact, that became the Nawabs of, uh, of Bengal. Okay, that's really insightful. Uh, so in this context, I would like to ask you that uh, one of the main focuses of your book is how European powers uh, systematically, uh, systematically established and destroyed the landscape and uh, the economic development of the region, first as merchant and then as colonizers, and how it contributed to the emergence of Calcutta as an industrial center. If you mm. can tell us a little about that. Yes, yeah, of course, Mamita. So one of the um, really important processes that the book tries to get a grip with is the way in which the English East India Company developed from being a, a trading body, um, an organization concerned with commerce, to a colonial power. Um, that story is also a story of the way in which a relationship of uh, equality between the English and the Nawabs of Bengal, for example, became over time a relationship of, of dominance where the English are in the ascendancy. So the book charts the transformation of the English presence in Bengal um, in various ways. The English growing military force on the banks of the River Hooghly, the increasing recourse to, to violence and reliance on uh, English military superiority, which by the middle of the 18th century is becoming, becoming clear. Competition between the English and the French on the river is an important part of that story as well. And then the process by which the Nawabs of Bengal have their authority undermined. Um, the iconic moment in that respect is, of course, the Battle of Plassey in 1757. Um, but either side of that key date, the, way, the, the, the book explores the way in which the English, the nature of the English presence on the river is transformed. Um, when I started writing the book, the Hooghly was a stage essentially, it was the place where these events happened. The Hooghly was a stage for, a, for writing a book about European colonialism. But I realized over time that the Hooghly was actually a really important part of the, the history. Uh, and the Hooghly, the river itself, became a kind of participant in the stories that I was telling. The relationship between um, people in the river is one of the book's key concerns, particularly uh, in its later, later chapters. So, for example, the way that the English, after establishing their political supremacy in Bengal, tried to profit from the river. They tried to well, in the first instance, to, 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 to navigate safely on it, which involves trying to map the river and understand it, and over time to try to profit from the river, to use it to extract the natural resources of Bengal, to use it for moving, um, moving goods, but also moving civil and military personnel between the Bay of Bengal and um, Upper India, the, the way in which the Hooghly connects to, to the Ganges and allows a passage right up as far as Ilobad and, and then across land to Delhi is a very important part of the story. So, so the relationship between the, the English colonizers and the river, the way in which the English try to exploit the river, and hopefully the way in which the river, we could say, fights back, the way in which the river resists attempts at control are really important elements of the story uh, as well, and hopefully uh, an interesting link with our conversation to come about the about the two stories that Ankita and Shaya Melina have uh, have written. Okay, so uh, thank you, Robert. Thank you for such deep insights. So I would uh, now like to move on to our two esteemed contributors, Ankita and uh, Professor Saikia. So coming to you, Ankita, first, uh, your story, Myth, a True Story, got published in, on TMS Review, September 2021 issue. So uh, first of all, congratulations once again for that. And what was, what was your inspiration uh, behind writing such a beautiful story? Uh, there was, mm, I won't say there was inspiration, but uh, yeah, I tried to think uh, what a river might think when it is flooding. I mean, we were all talking about flood uh, before this 
um, I mean, migration, displacement, and everything based on flood. So I was like, uh, I will write a short story, but what if I write from the perspective of a river and uh, not what we see? Like there is human suffering, there is a loss of property, there is a lot of, uh, you know, destruction, damage that is related. But uh, what if we think what a river thinks? Does it really want to flood? Does it really want to, you know, uh, do this damage and uh, this much loss of property, this much loss of life? Does a river want this? So that was the sole thing uh, which I you know, was thinking to pen down. And this was how this uh, myth, a true story got, you know, its shape. It's uh, not a very long story. So that's why the river has not much to tell. So. Yeah, it's not long and yeah, that is it. Still, it's very beautiful and thank you for sharing. Uh, okay, so coming to Professor Saik here. Uh, his story also got published uh, on Team West Review, September 2021 issue. So what inspires you to write such a heartwarming story? Uh, okay, thank you, Momita, for the question. Uh, actually, uh, what inspired me to write the story um, is the theme itself, which is the theme of flood and displacement. Uh, that is uh, a very common uh, problem in my state. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, my state, Assam, lies in a float, uh, you know, a flood prone area, and uh, floods are a way of life of this um, of the people. And there are two main rivers. Uh, in my state, the Brahmaputra and the Barak River. And uh, they have a number of tributaries, like almost 50 number of tributaries. And uh, they cause flood and uh, bring about devastation to life and property on a massive scale every year during the monsoon. So uh, uh, there's a uh, like uh, history behind these uh, flood and uh, though the frequency of these uh, flood have uh, increased uh, of late, um, I think uh, we can trace back uh, to the uh, trace its um, massiveness to the 1950 Assam Tibet earthquake, uh, from which um, I think uh, the frequency increased, the frequency of flood increased from this earthquake. And uh, the problem of flood uh, in this um, state is also caused due to the uh, flash floods um, flowing from the rivers of the neighboring states like uh, Arunachal Pradesh, Nagaland. And uh, every year, these uh, floods cause a huge, kind, uh, huge devastation um, to the flora and fauna uh, and human lives. And another problem that is related with this um, flood is the problem of erosion. And um, um, it also causes huge damage every year. And the natural disasters uh, like flood and erosion uh, has, uh, has a negative impact on the overall development of the state. And um, uh, the flood and erosion um, problem is uh, uh, very much different from that of the other states in India. And uh, there are many reasons behind there are many reasons behind the uh, causes of uh, behind the flood in this uh, region, uh, among which uh, encroachment of forest lands um, and uh, urbanization uh, can be termed as uh, some of the causes. And owing to these floods, uh, uh, wildlife is uh, quite harmed because uh, we, we can see that the Kajiranga National Park and the Pobitora Wildlife Sanctuary um, and other such uh, uh, forest areas get submerged, causing damage to this wildlife. And uh, significantly, uh, during the pandemic, uh, the misery of the people have increased uh, because they have not only to struggle with the flood, but they also have to struggle with the pandemic. So there is great misfortune for the people. And uh, though the center and the state governments have been uh, like doing a lot uh, to solve this issue, uh, the actions taken have not proven to be like effective. So um, 
this uh, problem of my state has led me to write the story and I can relate to the problems because I belong to the state. So that is how uh, the theme has inspired me to write uh, this story. Okay, uh, that's really vivid and insightful. Thank you for sharing. So I would now, now like to uh, ask Dr. Ivermi if you can give us some feedback on uh, the contributions of Ankita and Professor Saikia or any advice that you might have uh, for our contributors. Yeah, of course. Thanks, Namita. I've got lots of lots of questions. Um, I don't know how much uh, advice I have, but first of all, let me just say that I really enjoyed both of the stories. They were both um, really interesting, um, really enjoyable to read as well. And there were some themes that I noted that the two stories had uh, in common, I guess. Um, there was the idea of rivers as creative forces, but also as destructive. I think um, at various points, you use terms like life-giving to describe the river, but the river is also presented as being destructive or life-taking. Um, there's an interesting conversation to be had maybe about the theme of movement or migration. Um, so in your story, uh, Ankita, the main characters are on the move. Um, and we have this image at the end of the story of um, the main character uh, perpetually on the move, like a river that never stops flowing. Um, in your story, in contrast, um, Shai and Lina, I had the sense that, well, the movement, the migration is forced. The family at the heart of the story is forced to leave its home because of, because of the flood that you very movingly describe. So there's an interesting uh, comparison between uh, different types of migration, between um, migrants and what are essentially, in, in, in the second story, uh, climate refugees. Um, both of you, uh, something I found very interesting, both of you um, present a relationship between different generations of families, and both of you refer to grandmothers as um, uh, the storytellers in the family that like. There's this idea of stories being passed from one generation to the next, but I found um, but I found very interesting. Um, and then one other theme, I guess, is, the, is, is kind of the, the political context, maybe, in which the stories take place. So uh, in your story, and keep a political context is about a war. The context in general is, of course, China. There is reference to the Japanese invasion and occupation of China. Uh, in your story, Shai Molina, the political context comes out in the visit of the, um, the politician to the flood area, a very kind of mediatized event. So you show the cameras, the cameras coming with him and him making, making interesting, but not very full promises about repairing the flood damage to the cameras. Um, so, yeah, there's four kind of initial reflections, I suppose, but any, any one of which might, um, might lead us into an interesting conversation. I don't know if uh, either of you would like to, to come back in at, uh, at this stage. And Kita, you. Yes, uh, I actually, I don't know. I think there was uh, some network issue. I could not get your last, um, what you told just now. I would beg your pardon, sir. You okay. Please? Of course, yeah, apologies. I'm not, um, uh, I'm in a place for the white occasionally drops here at the moment. So apologies to catch all of that. The four themes that I kind of, identified that might lead to an interesting conversation that link both of your stories, I think, and some of my writing, writing about the Hoogley, perhaps, are one, this idea of the riv rivers as creative but also destructive forces, 
The second one, which maybe you heard, was around migration and movement. Um, the third was about the different generations. Um, the different generations involved in your stories and this idea of stories being passed from one generation to the next. Um, Shia Malin, I think you even refer to the river as being a carrier of stories uh, at the end of your, uh, your short story. Uh, and then the final point, which maybe you didn't catch because of the um, connection, is about the political context in which the stories take place. So uh, the domestic context or the, 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 the war, the occupation that's going on in the case of your story, uh, Ankita. Yes, uh, yes, uh, those are the four. Uh, I also, yeah, I also thought that we both have uh, these four themes in common because um, I actually, I mean, wrote about, Chi I mean, those two rivers, uh, Yangtze and uh, Huangho, because um, in India we have a lot of rivers, but I could not just make them a, a grandmother and a grandson. I mean, uh, or somewhat like that, because uh, the main rivers, Indus, uh, Ganges, Brahmaputra, and all of them, they are very different in their geological ages. In fact, Ganges is the uh, youngest among them, because uh, Himalayas, they are uh, young fold mountains, just 50 million years. But then I read that Indus is uh, around uh, 150 million years old. But the course, yes, obviously that has changed, but uh, the origin was very, uh, I mean, it was way million years past uh, the Ganges. So, but then grandmothers are basically storytellers. So I needed someone, I mean, a, a river, uh, I mean, a lady river, I would say, a she river that would become the grandmother for the grandson. And mm -hmm. here I also found them originating in the same region. So it was a good, uh, I mean, plot, or I would say uh, the locale was absolutely fine for me to construct the story. So, yeah, then I, f uh, I was searching about the floods because we had already studied in our in the junior classes that Wang Ho, it's the sorrow of China. So obviously floods would be there. And then 1938, that flood, it was caused by man. So man-made flood. And that intrigued me more to write about uh, this. I mean, write it in the form of myth. So um, over to you, Professor Shaikya, if you have your insights. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Robert Evermi, for the uh, feedback. Uh, as far as uh, the topic of uh, stories uh, passed from generations to generation is concerned, yes, I have mentioned the grandmother at the very beginning of the story, telling, uh, passing on stories to, to the grandson. Uh, there is a particular context in my story. Uh, the river Dikho, which is mentioned in my story, um, runs through Sivsagar district. Hmm. So um, then uh, this particular place has a historical, uh, like uh, a historical legacy because the Ahoms uh, ruled uh, this uh, place um, for about 598 years. And uh, we have a lot of historical monuments here in this Sivsagar district. And therefore, the river has been a witness to all the uh, things that have passed over the years, over the long, uh, over the, over generations. And it has seen battles being fought on its banks because the Ahoms have fought against the Mughals. Uh, they have fought against the Kasaris. And they were a very uh, warrior kind of race. And so the river is a witness to this kind of history. And therefore, the grandmother tells these kind of stories to the grandson. Mm. Then uh, as far as uh, the theme of uh, the river being a uh, creator as well as uh, destroyer is concerned, yes, I have uh, included this theme in my uh, story. Uh, there's this particular character called Rongmon, who is a little boy. And um, his father tells him, his father, um, tries to 
make him understand that the river do is a kind of force which devastates uh, destroys their property lives yet uh, it is also a kind of uh, source of fertility it makes their soil fertile it uh, it is a river on which they can uh, make their livelihood so they venerate the river they respect the river so they have to respect the river despite the devastation that it brings about every year so this is the theme of the destroyer and creator um as a characteristic of the river which i have mentioned in my story uh regarding the topic of displacement um yes i have uh, included the theme of displacement as uh, something that is uh, related to the villagers concern affected by floods who have to like uh, move away from their uh, beloved homes uh, which they have built very uh, with uh, very with very much difficulty and they have to move away from the homes their paddy fields their property and stay away for many months in uh, relief camps and again they have to after the flood uh, recedes uh, they have to move back so there is a kind of uh, cycle of building and uh, destruction and again building and destruction so uh, but the people have become accustomed to this kind of life um, mm. and i have even uh, like included uh, the theme of festivity that is seen in um, Uh, among the villagers um, they have become so accustomed to the way of life uh, the floods that they even enjoy uh, certain moments uh, like they enjoy fishing during the floods mm. so th that's a way of life for them mm. yes yeah, thank you i mean it was a very moving scene to see your story where the father is uh, is explaining or reminding the son i guess that yes that rivers are not bad that they are a creative force as well and that their water is necessary for you know process of regeneration i suppose uh, and the example that you mentioned at the end of fishing during the floods is an, a, a nice example of how even when they are at their most damaging um, rivers also are well bountiful in, in, in that they allow people the opportunity while well, in this instance to fish um so in your case um shamilin what you're writing about is the region that you're from and its experience it's it's is it it's either personal experience or experience of people that, that you know and that you've spoken to this kind of annual cycle almost of the river destroying homes and villages of having to take refuge and then having to rebuild um i myself um uh, i'm not from a, i have not spent my childhood in a village but uh, Uh, i have my relatives who live in villages and i have uh, like been a witness to all the devastation caused by floods every year and even today uh, we are witnessing but uh, as a uh, inhabitant of a town i i have spent my childhood in a small town and my town has also been a witness to floods and that is another kind of flood that is the flash flood that is caused due to urbanization um dumping of garbage in uh, drains in uh, sewage uh, links like sewage lines so there that is another kind of flood that i have experienced in my childhood and in my grown up years i remember uh, wading through uh, knee length water and going to school so that was a way of life uh, even though i haven't spent my time uh, in uh, in a village uh, perhaps but uh, still i have some personal experience of flood of a different kind though mm. yes thank you and in and ankita uh, in your case um the story is based around real events but in your case those events are in the past were in the 1930s there in china and you explain the reasons for choosing china and and, uh, and the two rivers in china specifically what kind of what kind of research did you have to do to uh, to know enough to be able to write the story I was uh, basically first I had this plot in mind that I need uh, two rivers who would be you know uh, who would be having this age gap 
otherwise they can't be uh, of from uh, two different generations basically three generations there should be because uh, this one is the grand today we have the this uh, i can say the boon of uh, having internet the blessing of internet so obviously i was going through all these uh, firstly i went through the geological eras of the rivers their ages nice. after that i was i mean you know totally after searching about all the rivers that were there in china so the river system i was going through them i was going through the map in detail so that i could find uh, a province if that's in common which i got qinghai it, it's nice. common so the, after that i was like okay let me see the course of the river i saw that so then i saw that okay they are separating at this part so that could be you know a, a moment in their life that they are separating from each other like today also we do we uh, many of us we live in nuclear families away from our grandmothers and grandfathers uh, our grandparents so it could be like that that the grandmother will not come Uh, she is uh, habituated or accustomed to her uh, society so she is there but the grandson has to move on he has to accomplish something more in life so he has come on the other side after that i saw uh, that yeah i should men i mean i put the word wuhan i put the area there because wuhan was very much it has been famous all across the globe throughout this pandemic so yeah i mentioned that place as well that okay so it's flowing through wuhan and after that i came to the uh, part where the grandson is like trying to follow his grandmother's words not to harm people he wants to live with them enjoy his life with them but then yes he can't do anything he is saying no don't do but it is being done and afterwards as a human would feel guilty he might not be able to face them with whom he has done injustice he just moves away so that is basically the course that uh, huang ho changes every time after it uh, gets flooded now that's actually a natural thing for a river to do it builds on one side and it destroys on the other so that is there and uh, so all the research i was doing i could not go to uh, yeah i could not go to china ms this pandemic to you know uh, but i do wish that one day i might go and actually see the places i've written about with my own uh, two eyes otherwise uh, i was totally in front of my mobile and laptop doing all of this thing i could not you know miss out one point because otherwise that would be a flaw in this whole uh, plot so yeah that was uh, all that i did i mean i don't think it was very much but yeah i had to know a lot more which i did not know i'm familiar with our river system india's river system but not the chinese ones so yeah that was there mm. yes i think one of the interesting things about any any writing process is um well doing the research and then deciding what you include and what you leave out and there's always lots of things that you can't include as well and there is no matter how much you'd no matter how much you'd like to yes um, absolutely Yes. Um both of you in your writing kind of ascribe human traits or human characteristics to the rivers that you're writing about. And in 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 Hugli in in my book that's something that I guess I do as well. Um the river is presented as having some sort of agency. The idea that I mentioned at the start of the river resisting attempts by humans to control it. Um the idea that the river yeah can can resist um that too is an example i guess of describing with some sort of human characteristics or at least with some sort of agency um did you make a conscious decision that you wanted to 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 present your rivers in that way or is that something that kind of came naturally i suppose we could think about other examples literary examples of rivers being written about as as characters in stories um that maybe you were inspired by the the other reason i ask this question is because certainly when it comes to the writing of history or other social sciences some scholars warn against um 
ascribing those those human like characteristics to natural forces. Um, they try to remind historians, for example, that they're not writing literature and probably shouldn't be um, attaching um, agency or, or human traits to um, natural forces like rivers. Um, but yes, in your case, um, how did you? What was the process by which you decided that is what you that, that is what you were going to do? Uh, well, in my case, I am a student of literature, so personification it runs in our nerves. <laughs> so yeah, I thought that um, well, everybody talks about floods, and it's a direct uh, you know accusation to the river that okay, so the river is doing this flood. Uh, we talk about the glaciers melting. We talk about a lot of things, but ultimately, it's uh, the river that is carrying the flood. Even if flash flash flood, the river mm -hmm. is doing that. We had a huge flood in Kerala also very recently. So they were all, you know, thinking that they had they might have upset the river god. So mm -hmm. I mean, I was going through some of the articles. So they were saying that even the the Amarnath, uh, uh, Amarnath or Kedarnath flood that happened. That also they were saying, okay, so uh, we must have upset some of the gods, maybe. So that's why uh, this is happening. We are we have incurred the wrath of the god. So yeah, and then I was like, why always uh, rivers? I mean, it could be that we are doing. Uh, and I basically used that incident of 1938 because at that time urbanization was not going on. At that time, global warming was not going on. At that time, uh, modernization was also not going on. We did not have any pollution, very less. Uh, there was, but less. So uh, at that time also, if we uh, do not blame on modernization, if we don't blame the floods or these uh, natural disasters on modernization, we still did some or the other thing in most of the cases that, you know, uh, intrigued this these rivers to carry their floods i mean the floods that they carried with them so i was like okay fine i'll do something from the historical point of view from uh, the past and also through the river so that river can tell that okay i did not want that flood to happen but yeah you did it was you so it can it can you know just point out in the face that it was you it was the man that did all of this through me now you're hiding behind me but yeah that is there at one point you you even described floods as being the tears of rivers yes. that have been upset by human uh, uh, intervention i guess i said about that, that they say that the god is upset like we have our, our water god varun uh, dev in uh, hindu mythology so it was said that okay we have upset him and then uh, that's why he is angry or sometimes like he is sad and like why would we do that but we are still doing something then we are just blaming the gods blaming the river blaming someone but not uh, coming up and taking the blame so that was there at one point thanks ankita uh, and uh Shaimilin, did you want to come back in here um on on, on the same point at one point you described the river as being angry, I think. Uh, uh, that would be one example of the kind of personification of the river in your in your story. Um, yes. Uh, uh, though it was not uh, a conscious uh, way of uh, like personifying my uh, way of depicting the river, but uh, it has come up, uh, it has been portrayed uh, such. Uh, yes, in one instant, uh, I have depicted the river as um, one which was silent till now, and but suddenly it uh, roused uh, and uh, created havoc in the lives of the villagers. So, um, and in the very beginning also, I have depicted the river as a kind of silent witness to many historical events uh, which has passed over the years. Uh, yes, uh, definitely there is a kind of... Uh, um, indirect indirect personification and um, the river which I have mentioned is Diko. It is a tributary. It is one of the tributaries of the Brahmaputra. And the river Brahmaputra is venerated 
worshipped as Ankita has said uh, in India a lot of rivers are worshipped likewise Brahmaputra is also worshipped in Assam um, though it causes havoc every year but we venerate it we respect it um, it is part of our lives and uh, um, I think uh, that is how I have personified but not consciously in my story mm. so in fact in many instances when we refer to rivers uh, we're thinking about divine agency the idea that the river is divine uh, as well as uh, as well as maybe human agency yes um a related theme Amita, are you happy for me to ask a couple more questions or do you want to, do you want to jump in So we're fine. Excellent. Okay. Um, so this 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 idea of human intervention then to try to control a river or to um, to try to benefit from it. Um, the penultimate chapter of my work on Hooghly is essentially about British colonial attempts to control the Hooghly River, to construct uh, embankments, to change or regulate the flow of the river to deepen certain channels, to make it more navigable, to uh, construct canals that link different parts of the river or, or, or the Hooghly with other rivers, um, and the kind of mixed success of those colonial, att colonial attempts at river engineering. Uh, and Keita, in your story, there's the, um, the, the building of a dam, or a, a dike, I think is the word that you use, across across the river is an important element could you say a bit more about that uh actually i was uh, going through the dive for the i mean we had read about it in geography so i was like okay so i did not know that uh, this particular 1938 flood was actually uh, a man-made flood because uh, we had already known like you that uh, Huang Hu was the of china so i thought uh, just happens every year, maybe it floods. But afterwards, when I searched, went deeper into this uh, whole plot, I saw that it was man-made. And then when I saw it, I I was going through, I see that it's because of the dikes. And these dikes were basically constructed to keep the Japanese out of China. Because at that time, the Japanese forces, they were invading uh, Chinese uh, towns. And at and most of uh, them were, you know, um, they were targeting those Chinese towns that had resources in plenty. So that is why they thought that if we flood the other portions through which they are entering, uh, that way it will be, you know, impossible for them to just come in and conquer China and leave or maybe settle down here. Because uh, and at, other, at other parts where they had already come in, they were, uh, I mean, the Japanese are they were not known to be very good like one thing that the Britishers did when they came to India uh, Indians they could at least live on their own they were doing business and they were at least fine but Japanese as I read in the history they had invaded the towns they were plundering they were uh, you know molesting women and everything everything that could be done was being done at that point itself so the Chinese uh, the people, the army, the Chinese military, the Chinese uh, emperors, they wanted to keep them away because they did not want to harm more people, more Chinese people. Uh, and because of that, the dikes, they were constructed. Dikes are also some sorts of embankments that are constructed to keep the water out of this particular uh, area that they want to save. But the other parts will get flooded because the water course will be changed uh, totally. So the thing that happened is it, it was not technologically advanced like we have today. Before the dams release water, they inform or evacuate the lower regions, but it was not done. And that is why the flood caused so much of casualty because they could not evacuate the people in the lower courses. Uh, so um, it was actually very, I, won't, I mean, I was not, you know, when I read about it, I was, I could not come to terms like why someone would think of doing that but then okay saving one citizens is uh, there but i noticed one more point that uh, 
they were saving the bigger cities so they were saving the uh, you know they were not caring about the poor people so i saw that okay that also existed at that time in 1938 back in china they are also differentiating between the rich those who will uh, those who are living in the cities in the capital cities they are contributing to the economy they are holding these higher positions so they care about themselves more and not about the poor who are living in the outskirts in the villages and all so that was also a point that i found and as for dikes yeah i told you yeah, they are like embankments they are, they basically change the course of the river they turn it around mm -hmm. so that it does not enter this particular city but goes on the other side and then uh, it's more like a fortification kind of a thing forts have these canals on the side so it was kind of like that and dikes are uh, not very common today but yeah in some of the fields we find uh, small i mean dikes in uh smaller demeners they are still used in uh, an an agricultural country like india it's still used in some of the uh, paddy fields and uh, mostly paddy fields because they use water a lot and a uh, sugar cane to grow sugar cane i've seen dikes are still used um, and uh, uh, yeah that's that's it i mean if you want to know something more absolutely you can ask me Excellent. Thanks. Thanks, Ankita. And in your case, um, you have, on the one hand, well, this is a question really, is there a sense in your story, I'm not sure, that human intervention on the river might be making the problem of flooding worse? Or is it simply a case that, in, in, in your story, more human intervention is needed because there's a suggestion that if the politician in the story fulfilled his promise and reconstructed an effective embankment, the village would be protected and maybe this annual cycle of flooding would be prevented so yeah where does where does kind of human intervention on the river fit in your in your story uh in my story uh, actually the context is a uh, village uh, situated on the banks of a river and uh, there is not much uh, like uh, human damage done to the river or um, that is found usually in a town in case of a city uh, these are not man-made uh, like disasters usually in villages um, as i said uh, if we go back to history uh, as i said in the beginning the 1950 uh, flood uh, sorry earthquake uh, changed the course of the brahmaputra and uh, the river has now been uh, unable to contain water and maybe it's uh, flooding its banks and uh, there is there are the issues of climate change etc but in my story uh, yes uh, i have mentioned the politician who has not fulfilled the promises um, there are lack of common initiative to take measures to address these problems and uh, embankments are made uh, constructed but they are not repaired or maintained or um, in some cases there are no embankments so these are the problems that the villagers have to face and uh, uh, struggle with mm. and then the other kind of external party that features in the story you have the politician who is i guess a representative of the, the state so there is some state relief some aid for the for the victims of the flood in the village they spend a bit of time camped out on the highway i think before before being taken to some sort of relief center and then at relief center the other kind of external party that becomes important in the life of the family and of the villages more widely is an ngo is there a comment in your story about the role of ngos in in, in um, providing or flood relief or, or, or support in general? Uh, yeah, there are several NGOs working uh, during times of flood. Uh, there are, they are uh, humanitarian, no doubt, but uh, in many cases, uh, there is uh, measures are taken or they uh, distribute uh, commodity things uh, to the flood affected people and there is more of publicity rather than actual aid that is given to them um, 
so these are the internal issues uh, but as a whole uh, uh, there are organizations associations taking up the issue uh, pressing the um, like uh, urging the government to take steps uh, but uh, in certain cases we find there is uh, a kind of show being made or uh, there is um, people are more concerned about publicity Mm -hmm. uh, about being humanitarian and uh, so these are the things I have like tried to portray in my story mm. yeah that comes across very strongly that idea that some of the uh, some of the aid or is more about appearances or publicity than it is about really helping the villagers and the, the long term yeah. the long term help the things that could yeah. stop the problem at its root like building a better river embankment are, are, are not taken seriously. The states and the other agencies are simply reactive to the problem when it arrives. So there are short term uh, aids been, been given, but uh, yes, as you have said, long term um, actions are not taken. Um, mm -hmm. These are uh, just for short lived solutions are offered. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Um, one one final question from me that comes to mind at the moment, at least, is around um, gender in your stories. So usually, when the rivers you refer to are personified or deified, they are presented as female. Um, and usually, the human actors uh, who are intervening in the life of the river, or many of them at least, are men. Um, some of the problems are presented as being problems created by by man. Maybe, 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 maybe man is meant there to represent all humans. But is there something more specific about gender? Is gender an important element in in what you've written? Uh, I don't know which one of you wants to jump in there first. Uh, gender. I mean, it was not. Uh, not in my mind specifically because uh, genders in india i know is given to rivers rivers not having any tributaries were called actually um males and uh, those that had tributaries and distributaries they were called uh, females kind of a thing there was but here i did not specifically use any i mean gender like that because uh, i just searched up what the people there think the river to be if uh, like yangtze kyang it is a river system so it's uh, basically river yangtze uh, that is deified or they uh, call it to be a female river there in china and uh, huanghu is always a male river so that is why i placed them as grandmother and grandson if I would have uh, got another, I mean, if Wang Ho would have been a, a female, I would have just made that into a granddaughter. I was, I just had that age gap in mind. I had this grandmother telling a story, and I also wanted uh, rivers originating uh, in the same region around. Them. So that was there, and not much about gender specifically. That I need to uh, portray something like that. It was not there. Okay, there's a line uh, just uh, uh, I'm just looking at in your story when you're describing how um, the river is blamed for things like its flooding, and the line is men do not care, all they do is curse and abuse. But when you when for example you write about men there, you weren't you weren't necessarily thinking about well, uh, you were thinking more of humans than of men specifically. Yes, it said like men do not do this and that. So I was like, okay, because at that time, if it's 1938, so the uh, storytelling must be long before that. So uh, it's like, okay, men do not do this. At that time, females were not discussed about so much. Uh, more stories have males and all. So it was man as a gender and man as human altogether. It was not something uh, gender specific. I was just uh, how a grandmother would uh, tell a story or tell things to his mm. uh, to her grandson. How the grandson was 
would uh, think or reminisce what the grandmother might have told. I was just writing it like that. It was not gender specific that uh, I need to include a female or this person has to be a male or something like that. I was not blaming any of the gender or something like that. It was just nature and man, mm. uh, humanity. Yeah. Thanks, Ankita. And yes, yeah, same, same question for you, I guess. Uh, Shamalina, how does gender feature, if it's all, in your story? Uh, well, uh, uh, gender um, is not referred, uh, like, uh, directly addressed directly. The theme of gender is not addressed in my story directly. But uh, uh, when we talk about uh, Brahmaputra, uh, we take it as a kind of uh, male god. So like we take Ganga as a female mm. goddess, uh, or we take it as a goddess. Um, we assume uh, it is a female one. So likewise, uh, Brahmaputra is taken to be male. Uh, but uh, there is no such a reference of gender in my like story. But uh, when you have uh, talked about the theme of gender, I wish I could uh, include one uh, woman in my uh, story and I could relate it with the river. Uh, so there will be another kind of plot. Mm. So I wish I could do that. But uh, my story revolves around this simple boy. And uh, you do have, you do have the, boy's, the boy's mother does feature in the story, right? And the, the relationship between the mother and father. Uh, is one yeah. element that's that's interesting yeah. or could, could be developed further. Yeah, I wish uh, I could uh, take the character of a woman because a woman has to struggle more in times of uh, misfortune. Mm -hmm. So, but as regards as the river is concerned, I have not uh, uh, like mentioned any gender. Mm -hmm. Yes, and I'm not yeah. sure if it's specified or not, but the politician who comes makes his promise as well should we assume that the politician is a man yeah mm. okay excellent um there is perhaps uh, apologies i said i said the last the previous question was the last one but one final question that comes to mind is perhaps about the role of literature in telling stories about floods and flood victims in general um there's a suggestion at the end of your story, sorry, I mean, the role of literature, one of the roles of literature can play is to um, generate uh, compassion or, or, or uh, for the victims of floods to generate, uh, but maybe, maybe to, to raise awareness, but maybe to do more than that. There's something that literature specifically can do that makes the victims of floods relatable, I guess, um, that makes uh, that makes those people, the victims, seem more human rather than simply being, I don't know, statistics maybe on a, in a news report. Um, so yes, is there something specific that literature can do to, um, to issues, I guess, going to only become more important in the future as, you know, more extreme weather events become more frequent and sea levels rise? Um, what can literature do in response to flooding and, I guess, the climate crisis in general? I think uh, literature has a role to play in all fields. Uh, so, uh, whatever we write becomes a part of uh, literature. So, even if uh, maybe not directly as scientists, but literature might uh, you know, be a tool for awareness, more and more awareness, because uh, literature is what people read, students read in schools. So there could be these good stories that uh, they would love to read and also get aware that we are, we might someday become someone like them who caused the blood. So we should not be like them or something on the lines of that. So I think uh, even if not as a uh, scientists of the climate change or as the scientists of uh, why floods happen of uh, uh, as a geographer or something like that. 
uh, literature would rather you know amuse and also aware maybe uh, the people at large the masses i would say uh, yeah, so uh, professor saikia you would say yeah uh, as regards as uh, literature is concerned in the uh, bringing about uh, awareness uh, regarding climate issues, climate change, global warming. Yes, I think storytelling is a very effective tool uh, to bring about this awareness because children usually uh, f find it uh, boring or difficult to read textbooks, uh, science-related textbooks. And I think storytelling can be an effective way to uh, make them aware of these issues. and. Um, uh, as Ankita has said, it is entertaining as well as uh, like giving information. Uh, so and there have been uh, many um, of late, uh, there have been many uh, uh, literary genres which have been like uh, dealing with these issues like climate change, etc. Thanks. Yeah. And maybe for historians like me or for other uh, academics we can also try to write stories i guess the, the the books that we write or the histories that we can write should try to be engaging and to tell stories and to not be too too dry i guess that's certainly an important um, lesson that i would take away from 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 reading your from reading your stories so thank you to both of you. Um, I don't know if uh, or where we go from here, if there's anything that you'd like to, to ask each other or to ask me. Uh, not really. I just I noted one thing while I was, uh, I was just listening to the last answer by Professor Saikia. I think behind you, the screen, the red screen that's there, there are dragons. and. I think there are dragons. That are, those are dragons. I mean, we were talking a lot of China, and so I just uh, thought if uh, those were dragons, and that that would, you know, uh, maybe get along with the story too well. I mean, uh, Doctor Ivermi, I mean, the red screen that you're sitting in front of. I think they are dragons. I don't know. Yeah, I think they probably are. Yeah, this was a. Uh... Oh. This was, uh, I don't know the, the story behind this, um, this kind of sheet that I'm, that I'm sitting behind only, but it was brought back by somebody in my family from, uh, from China. And yes, I guess they are dragons, but I'm, I don't know much more than that, I'm afraid. <laughs> no, uh, we were talking about China, so I just thought, are they dragons? Okay, so that's what, mm. because Chinese uh, culture, they have a lot of dragons associated with them. Southeast Asia, they have these dragon dances and dragon festivals. And yeah, so there are a lot of lots of legends as well related to dragons. So yeah, that was there. Um, rest uh, questions. <laughs> I don't think I have any. So there was a lot to take away from the session, though. So I would like to thank you, Professor Ivomi, because uh, yeah, the questions that you pointed out. They were, uh, I never thought uh, of some of the questions that could come up. That those could also come up. So, yeah. Thank you for the questions. Uh, over to you, Professor Saikia. Uh, it was uh, really, really wonderful to get the feedback from Dr. Robert Avermi and uh, listening to Ankita. Uh, regarding uh, regarding my uh, like uh, question if, if i have any question yes i would like to ask uh, robert ever me if uh, uh, if there is a way that we can uh, depict uh, history um, in stories as you have done in your book uh, how do we um, weave history in a story mm. uh, because uh, uh, we belong to literature and uh, we do not have much uh, knowledge about history so uh, can you give some like uh, suggestions as to how we can develop our stories uh, by incorporating historical elements uh, into our writing 
Uh, yeah, I can try. Thanks. Thanks for the question. Um, one of the reasons I wanted to write a book about the Hoogli um, is because the river has so many stories through history, I guess, in a place where people from all around the world came together, um, generated new stories. There's an element, a strong element of kind of cross-cultural exchange and interaction uh, in the history of the Hoogli. Um, and after going back to the question right at the start about where the idea for the book came from, after um, writing my PhD, I wanted to write something that was more story based, I suppose, and therefore more uh, that had some serious messages in it, but was also um, also an, uh, uh, an enjoyable narrative to read full of in different interwoven stories. The seven chapters of the book uh, focus on different places along the river. So, uh, and within each chapter, there are different stories. The chapters overlap with each other, but they work, I think, as a kind of a set of different but interrelated um, histories. Um, so, I guess I've been writing, I wrote the book as a historian who wanted to write in an engaging way to maybe take some elements from the writing of literature to make sure that interesting stories came across and were written in an engaging way in the book. Um, I guess uh, in your an case, Ankita, you're doing the opposite in a way. You're starting from the perspective of uh, uh, somebody wanting to write a short story, to write a work of fiction, but doing so having undertaken some historical research and maybe Maybe those two different approaches meet somewhere in the middle. Maybe there are interesting ways of combining um, historical research with writing literature that, that blur the boundaries a little bit between the two. Um, I don't know if you want to, 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 to come in and say anything there. Uh, let's see what happens. Um, one thing that I thought of asking you just now, hearing the word Hoogli, um, what more rivers would you like to work on? Are there mm -hmm. any more rivers as such? Um, I think there's more to be written about, about the Hoogli, so I'm not sure that I've completely finished with the Hoogli as a river. Um, and the theme that comes out in the later chapters of the book about the relationship between the people in the river, about human attempts to control the Hoogli. That's definitely a theme that I want to return to in future writing. Um, that could be uh, about the Hoogli, but it could be about any number of rivers that have uh, been affected by those human attempts to um, exert some sort of control over them or to profit from them. Um, writing about that is a way into writing about uh, climate change as well and about the origins, well, perhaps not the origins, but um, some of the early important moments in the creation of our you know, current climate crisis. Um, so but it's more the themes than, the, than, than a specific geographical context that I want to, that I want to, want to come back to. So uh, maybe that will be about another river in South Asia, uh, I'm not sure. Maybe it will be more about the Hoogli and about the Bengal Delta. Um, the final chapter of Hoogli looks at Saga Island, Ganga Saga, at the mouth of the River Hoogli, and among other things, <laughs> among other things, looks at the attempts of British colonisers to cultivate that island, to make it productive, to grow things on the island, and the way in which those attempts were undermined by by flooding, um, by cyclones, and other extreme weather events um, and of course those problems in the Bay of Bengal and at the uh, the uh, where the Bengal Delta reaches the sea have only got worse in the last well 100 years or, or let's say since since the um, the end of the colonial period and since Indian and uh, Bangladesh uh, independence um, so there's undoubtedly much more to be written about about um, the human impact on that natural environment or those natural environments around the around the Bay of Bengal 
Um, so yeah, lots of possibilities, but um, the details remain to be remain to be seen. But this idea of writing something that will try to bridge some boundaries between different disciplines and maybe to blur that distinction between literature and history that's certainly um certainly appealing although not necessarily easy to do yeah because history to me is also like a story you start from somewhere then you end up somewhere it's more like a story so mm -hmm. yes absolutely thank you sir that was a lovely answer i mean uh, recently, also due to Amphan, uh, a part of Sundarban that got submerged uh, just uh, last year. So it was also there. So the cyclonic storms that are constantly happening. Mm. Yeah, that reminded your uh, your uh, that were those reminded me of Amphan recently. Mm. So yes, thank you, sir. You answered my question beautifully. Thank you. No, no, thank you. It was a, it was a good question. And just to say. Uh, maybe we're accustomed to thinking in the UK or in Europe of flooding as something that happens in other places, in other parts of the world. But we've seen in the last year in places like Germany uh, and in the UK, in fact, that you know, flooding, flooding can, happen, uh, can happen anywhere. It can happen in any country. It can affect and displace any people. And it's going to become more common in the next well, in the years that come. So, uh, yeah, something that I'm very keen to, to, to avoid is falling into that trap of thinking of thinking about flooding as something that happens elsewhere, uh, to join the dots. And maybe the kind of the global history approach that I use for, for writing the Hoogie book is a way of making sure that we don't focus only on one country or on one part of the world and that we are thinking about um well global issues and in the case of uh, in the case of climate change a, a, a global problem yes maybe hobby one day will start perhaps <laughs> mm. could be yes. yes thank you sir uh yeah moment of please yes okay so as we have come almost towards the end or end towards the session uh, i would like to thank all of you for your valuable time and congratulations to ankita and professor saikya once again all the best for uh, your future endeavors uh, we look forward many more participations from both of you and a reminder for our viewers that TMOS Review September 2021 issue is now available worldwide by Amazon. So please let us know your feedback on the same. So thank you. Bye bye. Good night. Thank you. And thank thanks you again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.